Hi and welcome. My name is Pierre-Henri Opneau. I'm the founder of Studio PHH Architects. It was an honor for me to work with the nonprofit Connecté and of course with the professors in Haiti who dedicate their lives every day to the creation of the school and to the students. A big thank you to Eckersley O'Callaghan who took on the structural design for this project pro bono and dedicated their time to the execution of it. Uh, we will be joined in the second half of the presentation by Gregor Horstmeyer from Eckersley O'Callaghan. This photo of the site was taken in 2017 after the school had purchased the land and during our first meeting with the professors. The site is located between an orphanage and houses which can be seen in this photo. It was used as storage for construction materials, trash dumping, but was simultaneously a place where children went to play. The mature trees, which you can see, were in good shape and provide rare cover from the Haitian sun. These were carefully saved and became an integral part of the design. The site planning for this phased project organizes the school buildings on the outside of the site, providing a large central courtyard for gatherings of various sizes. These buildings dovetail with the existing trees, which, along with the roofline, provide a continuous canopy and a sense of safety for the students. Designing in Haiti. One of the drivers in the design was our goal to work with locally accessible materials and to provide jobs to the local workforce. The result of this is that the construction and process has been an educational resource for local workers that can be reapplied in future projects. The material limitations in Haiti focused our selection to CMU block, reinforced concrete, and site welded metal. These materials were carefully deployed in order to increase airflow, provide natural light, increase safety, and to control sound transmission between the classrooms. This image shows the previous classroom with our new school in the background. The same corrugated metal roofing, metal doors, and windows, reinforced concrete columns are present in both. All simple construction, locally sourced, and contextual. The school was developed as a series of repeating modules, each comprising four classrooms. This was done to work through issues bound to occur in this type of project. Phase one of the project, one and a half modules shown here, was used as a learning opportunity for the contractor, his engineers, and for our design team as we adjusted to construction norms in Haiti. A number of challenges occurred in phase one, but the second phase of the project, which is twice as large, has been built without any issues. The combination of a modular and a phased approach has proved successful in troubleshooting problems. In order to continue to simplify the project within each module, repetition of details and of construction methods was a careful consideration. The piers, doors, and trusses are all built in the same way, and each module consists of mirror image classrooms, further simplifying the project. The facade's rhythm of reinforced piers and openings, a big part of the school's architectural identity, is based on the playful shifting of the CMU blocks, with the piers transferring all the bearing, uplift, and shear loads down to the foundations. The robustness of the structural system, largely based around these piers, was a consideration throughout the design process. Haiti is in a hurricane-prone region. The school also sits at the confluence of multiple active fault lines. Buildings, buildings in the area are subject to both extreme wind and seismic events. Lightweight materials such as timber are not readily available on the island of Haiti. The large mass of the most common building materials, concrete and masonry, generate large seismic forces and structures as a result of ground shaking, which is typically the governing lateral consideration. One of the most important factors in the successful outcome of this project was our team's significant efforts to provide clear and concise communication through our drawings. By limiting the engineering design palette to just a few reinforcing bar sizes, we work to define clear and simple reinforcing diagrams to eliminate confusion on the construction site. Additionally, we specifically aim to work with common steel sizes, shapes, and single wall thicknesses so that mistakes during fabrication would be avoided.
The design and construction team spoke a mixture of languages, mainly English, French, and Haitian Creole. Unique tags and markers were adopted across the drawing set so that cross-referencing would be simple and universal, no matter what language was spoken by the workers on site. This allowed the contractors and subcontractors to easily digest the drawings. Thank you, Pierre. Hi, everyone. My name is Gregor Horstmeyer, and I was the lead structural engineer on this project with the Eckers Leo Callahan. As Pierre's mentioned, this project posed quite a few unique challenges architecturally, structurally, and from a construction perspective. Structurally, the building had to be designed for both hurricane force winds as well as large seismic events. So that's quite unique for someone like myself who's come from traditionally designing in the United States where the design load case on the West Coast is always seismic events and the design load case on the East Coast is always um, from wind or hurricane events. And so this project was unique in the sense that we actually had to design and detail everything for both kind of governing load cases. And that ended up me meaning a lot of time had to go be spent into thinking about exactly how we could achieve the design intent and details um, with the limited material palette av available in Haiti. And beyond the material palette limits, we also had to consider what was actually available from a construction equipment perspective. So one of the first aspects of the project or steps in the project was to get a detailed list from the contractor of what equipment was going to be available so that we could understand what was achievable to be built. So if the contractor had come to us and said, you know, I can't, there is no availability for me to actually get a crane to the location and crane large pieces of metal up to an elevation, um, like a roof elevation, then we would know that informed us that we had to design the roof trusses to be light enough to be actually able to be installed and moved by, by, by hand by a group of workers. And so that's just one example of the considerations we had to kind of make. And as you can see here, excavators weren't available as well. So the removal of material for the foundations was actually done by hand. Probably the most critical aspect of the design of this building is the lateral system. So being governed by both seismic events and wind events, a lot of thought had to go into the lateral system and the detailing of that system. For this building, uh, in plan, we actually have kind of two different orthogonal directions, one being flexurally dominated and the other one being shear dominated with long continuous shear walls. The flexurally dominated um, orthogonal direction of the building um, is comprised of a series of um, cantilever masonry shear walls. And those masonry shear walls are all defined as special reinforced masonry shear walls in ASE 7. And that is kind of the most stringent or the, the, the design, the kind of seismic classification with the highest amount of ductility. And so as soon as you kind of step into that realm of special reinforced masonry shear walls, there's a lot of strict detailing requirements that need to be met and kind of performance requirements established by both ASE 7 as well as TMS 402 or ACI 530. And so we had to spend a lot of time to make sure that the detailing of the building was in conformance with that code to ensure maximum ductility but also that all of those details were easily buildable and easily um, translated onto the drawing so that we could communicate easily with people that you know we didn't have a common language with, or at least from on the structural engineering team, we didn't have a common language with. And um, that was probably one of the most critical aspects of this design, really thinking through how we're going to detail things so that it can be built simply and easily and repeatedly. So as you can see here on the far right of the image, in order to ensure ductility in the system, we actually had to find a very fine balance of the reinforcement ratio in the shear walls relative to the kind of demand being placed on them. So we ended up having a strain multiplier of four meaning on the system, meaning that when these shear walls um, flex or ha are in a seismic event or in a wind event and they experience flexure, the strain that's in get the strain that is in the um, farthest the, the the reinforcement that is in tension has actually yielded by a factor of four. So it's four times the the yield criterion of steel 
at the point where we've designed for the masonry to be at its maximum stress prior to crushing. And so that really ensures that the steel that's being used undergoes a long period of elongation, as you can see in the diagram. And that entire elongation period in each cycle of the seismic event, or as the walls are flexing over into wind event, as it's elongating and yielding through that entire period of four times the yield amount, it actually is dissipating energy that entire time. So prior to the concrete crushing, we're ensuring that the steel is yielding and dissipating energy. So we're really forcing all the energy dissipation to go into the steel and ensuring that none of it actually goes into the masonry. So this is kind of what an elevation of the flexure dominated shear walls looked like. So it's a series of these pillars or these piers that are kind of slab connected and connected at the top with a header beam. And so each one of these walls is effectively designed as a kind of a cantilevering finger sticking out of the ground, out of the, the, the foundation system. And they all kind of are moving in unison together. Um, and so a lot of time and analysis went into designing the, the, the stiffness of the connection from the slab to the pier, as well as the header beam to the pier, and ensuring that we kind of had a, uh, the, and ensuring that all of the, the shear walls kind of distributed forces uniformly and were all acting together in unison to stabilize the building. Um, we ended up, you know, really making sure that the design of each one of these piers was common, as common as possible, so that the construction would be seamless and repeatable. And it, we achieved this through a, a series of stepwise diagrams that showed both kind of the position of the shear reinforcement in the shear walls, as well as the flexural reinforcement in the shear walls. And the roof structure itself is quite unique, and so quite a bit of time had to be spent rationalizing the geometry, both to ensure that the structural system in the roof was um, you know, very s simple and determinant so that we could build it in a series of stepwise functions as well as constructible from the perspective of the contractor so that all of these individual roof trusses could be built with some sort of repetition and easily installed on site. So, you know, one of the things that had to really be thought through here was what's the availability of the trusses and the material and what kind of is the contractor able to to do on site with these trusses so we had to ensure that each of the individual segments that were going to be brought to site and fabricated there could actually be installed by a, se a series of workers or a group of workers because there was no kind of crane available to do that and so um, a series of construction diagrams were developed both for fabricating each of the individual trusses as well as for kind of connecting the trusses together and installing them on the uh, masonry um, superstructure that was uh, in place already. You know, luckily with this project, um, although there were some challenges and um, problems that had to be addressed, none of them were, you know, um, hugely critical. Um, you know, we had issues such as the kind of embeds for the handrail at the perimeter of the slab were kind of rotated 90 degrees so we had to work through that with the contractor as well as kind of things like the stair treads not being parallel to the path of travel um, the largest issue was kind of a miscommunication and misunderstanding of the placement of some top reinforcement for a cantilevering section of the slab and we were able to rectify this um, with the installation of some kind of columns that were able to prop up the slab. So there was an architectural sacrifice there, but um, structurally speaking, we were able to um, rectify this uh, situation pretty easily and um, pretty swiftly. And here's an image that you can see of the kind of completed uh, upper level of the building. So you can see the the, the slab edge, the, the guardrail that we just spoke about, as well as the, the, the wall segments, the cantilever wall segments, and the roof structure. And with the roof structure, quite a bit of thought and time had to go be spent into making sure that we understood all the distribution of forces in the flexible diaphragm system so that we could get make sure that the collectors and the cords of the roof diaphragm were distributing loads into the lateral building system. The project is now into phase two. So once phase one was complete, they kind of took a little bit of a break and then started phase two, which is a, a repetition of the same modules that were built. And 
here are some images of the kind of foundation work being done at the beginning, the lateral system being built and complete in May of this year, and the roof steel being installed in August of kind of 2020. And finally, um, I think either now or, or in a very short period of time, the entire building will, the phase two will be complete and children will be attending school. So I just wanted to thank um, Pierre and the Connective Foundation for um, getting us involved with this project. It was a wonderful experience for everyone at EOC, and we certainly um, learned a lot and found the project you know, incredibly fulfilling. So it was, it was great to be a part of this, this wonderful project.